meeting is recording and in progress. Go ahead, Brian, and take it away. Welcome. Um, we just wanted to convene uh, the, this group of providers um, and, and especially with the, you know, we're, we have behavioral health providers, we have DD waiver providers, CCC plus waiver providers, DME and home care providers um, that, that would have received, uh, um, uh, the associations would have received invitations and shared Amongst providers, um, we welcome you, especially the DD waiver providers, especially because you are probably one of the largest fee for service providers that we still have, you know, processing directly through the DMAS system. So it's important for everybody to hear the, the Medicaid enterprise solution updates um, as we are actively transitioning uh, from our legacy MMIS system over to the, um, the MES. And um, at this point, you will want to stop learning from me, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Chris Gordon. Uh, we have our, our, our chief um, chief information financial officer, uh, Chris Gordon, on the online. Carla Russell from Information Management, Mary Ann Passiani, the acting director for Information Management, um, and uh, we have Kimberly Shaw, who is, is uh, focused on training materials uh, related to the transition and this massive project that they've been doing. Uh, for a while now, so I'll turn it over to Chris and uh, we uh, get to the, the information. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Dr. Ward. Um, can you confirm? It looks like the blue lines around me, so you can hear me. Great. So we have a, a, a really simple slide deck we wanted to step through for you this morning. I know we have an hour set up. Um, certainly, we can use that time as, as necessary um, <clears throat> to make sure that we answer your questions. And really, this is about uh, letting you know what you need to know in order to prep uh, properly and posture your, your clinics, your systems, um, your own teams in, in readiness for go live. So um, we are going to be monitoring the chat. Since I'm going to be presenting, I'm not going to monitor the chat. The team, uh, Miriam Passioni, Terry Leahy, Carla, um, can, will be doing either responses written in the chat or we can at the end take questions and verbally address them as well to make sure we get both um, the, the typing as well as the um, verbal Q&A uh, going to make sure that we're getting everybody's question in. So um, the first slide right here is just what you need to know, and this is what you need to know. Uh, you need to know that in 2015, the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services directed DMAS to um, implement a modular system instead of our legacy Medicaid Management Information System, or MMIS, as you currently know it. Um, what that meant is or means is that we had to go from one vendor that does it all to uh, separate vendors that modularly um, control and implement different components. So some of those you see here, visionary integration professionals, VIP, they host our appeals module. Conduit hosts our financial module. Deloitte, you see in the center, and that's on, in, on purpose. They're the integrator. They actually are the hub and get all of these uh, connect all of these dots, if you will. Gainwell is our vendor that uh, provides our provider, and that's actually what we want to talk about a lot here, is our provider solution. So a lot of the, when you're look, checking for member eligibility, service authorizations, remits, et cetera, that's through Gainwell's provider solution portal. Optum is a vendor that hosts our uh, electronic data warehouse system. So we uh, internally at DMAS, we use that. It, it braids together data from financial data, member data, all of those things so we can actually do really good queries and to answer tough questions that we get from you, the members of our community, the General Assembly, and interested uh, parties to make sure that um, we get you the best information because Medicaid, as you know, is a treasure trove of information about healthcare for some of our most vulnerable populations in Virginia. And now that stands um, actually as of Wednesday at 2,200,000 folks that are now Medicaid members in Virginia, which represents 25% of the population of this state, huge number. The last there is uh, Magellan Health. Obviously, obviously that's critical uh, for, this, for this group here. Um, the Magellan uh, Health System, they actually are a part of that uh, and help from the pharmacy benefit side. Uh, they're also, as well as our uh, service authority as well. So they're a key component of MEZ. So this is uh, looking at this kind of um, in a little more uh, sort of pictorial way. This is our lollipop diagram, as we say, integrator, ISS is in the center, pharmacy benefit, um, all of these others and their definitions are listed here. 
the key thing that I want to draw your attention to is the last three modules. The ones that are starred here are already live. The last three, CRMS stands for Care Management Solution, as you see here. PRSS um, stands for Provider Services Solution. You can see that here. And MMIS stands for that um, Medicaid Management Information System that you can see here. These three last modules all go live on April 4th. That is a Monday. That's the first Monday in April. They go live at 6.15 in the morning. Um, and, and this is why we want to present this information because there's a couple key things you need to know about before that goes live. Um, and this is a really great um, slide that shows um, the key milestone dates and where we are. So earlier this week when we gave this presentation internally to the agency, um, this was basically where we were. Um, and these are sort of the six go live steps before MES goes live on April 4th. So PRSS has done a great job converting all of the data. As of this morning, our CIO, Marian Passioni, informed me that 100%, again, 100% of the provider data, uh, provider information, all of that information that's currently in the conduit MMIS system has been converted over to the provider system solution, the Gainwell system. So all of the new information um, that we have, specifically taxonomy, that's gonna be a, key, a huge player, a huge piece of getting claims authorized in the future. CMS, in, in addition to directing the agency to go modular, also requires and has required uh, for a long time, making sure that they get additional enhanced information on taxonomy. And what that means is, if you're a provider with a clinical specialty or subspecialty, that information is going to be included when you submit claims. That will enable CMS to do greater analysis on the data. Currently, right now, when <clears throat> we submit information uh, to um, CMS, the biggest clinical uh, concern that, that, is, that we tell our federal partners is other, right? And so this will help them get a better sense of what that other is, if nothing more than to have the taxonomy there. So um, next week, Monday, the system will open, our PRSS Gainwell system, the portal will open for delegate registration. So what that means is every single entity that has a provider that has a tax ID number has a specific email attached to it. Um, we've been sending emails out, notifications to everybody since November. Um, and that, pr that primary account holder, that PAH designation, that closed uh, registration for that on March 7th. So now, 14 days later, on March 21st, um, the, the portal itself is opening, and that will allow you to delegate folks, your team to delegate folks um, that are organizational administrators, so subsection, subunits, you can delegate the responsibility out for. Um, submitting information for checking claims, et cetera. So you can you can broaden that out, and that opens again on Monday. Another key piece that we wanted to draw your attention to is following that week, um, we will have, or following the 21st, we will have a pause in our payment. Um, so while we will make payments on March 25th, as DMAS always does every single Friday and twice on Fridays, we always pay people on Fridays. That's the deal. That's what we've done forever. We will make a payment on March 25th. We will also make a payment on April 1st. However, we will have a skip week on Friday, April 8th. During that week, no payments will be made. We will make up those payments on Friday, April 15th. That's a key piece there that you need to know about. Um, the other piece we want to draw your attention to is there's a five-day outage that starts on March 30th. Uh, and what that means is, you know, what, you should, what is that outage? What does that mean? What that means is the current MMIS system that you use, the current portal, you go to the conduit-hosted MMIS system, that's not going to be able, you, can, you won't be able to log in there and get the typical information that you do. So what do you normally get from there? You normally get Medicaid member eligibility. You might be able to check the status. Is this person a member or not of Medicaid? Meaning, are we able to bill, them, bill Medicaid for the care that we provide? The other thing uh, that you won't be able to check is service authorization. So a lot of our procedures um, require service pre-approval, right, service authorizations. And so as a result, you won't be able to check that information 
either during that five day outage. So again, it begins on the 30th for three business days. So Wednesday the 30th, uh, Thursday the 31st, and then Friday the 1st. Those three business days, you won't be able to check anything. And then on Saturday and Sunday, um, April 2nd, April 3rd, it will also be out. And that's in preparation to transfer over the last code data sets, load all of the rates in the new system um, so that we can have a fresh go live on uh, 6.15 in the morning on uh, April 4th. Um, so these are some of the dates I've mentioned here. One of the key pieces, and I think this is one of the best parts of uh, the new um, MES system, is something we called ICAM. It's Identity, Credential, and Access Management, or uh, that's the, what the acronym means there. Uh, and what that does is it, cybersecurity risk, I think everyone would acknowledge. They've heard about that in the news. It's a major risk. I, agencies are continuously under attack uh, for this, especially in state government, uh, a lot of your organizations. Um, and so what, we're, what this does is it enables something called single sign-on, meaning uh, it's linked, the account information is linked to your email. And when you go to log in, it is going to require you uh, to send a code and you designate that telephone number that, you know, whatever, whatever mechanism you want to get that code, it will require you to send the code and then um, they get that information, you get that information, and you put that unique new alphanumeric or numeric code into uh, the portal and then you're able to gain access. It's kind of like now, uh, if you do credit card access or remote email or any VPN stuff like that, it's the same thing, um, but it's an extra security step. And it again, prevents the bad folks from uh, getting access to critical HIPAA and financial information regarding. We've, this has been a major security concern for DMS for a number of years, and this helps to remediate that. We've had great success actually going live with this. We've been rolling it out to different vendors um, and stakeholder communities uh, so far, and we've had 100% uh, success with that, no issues so far. It's been a very good success. Um, and then, uh, go ahead. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I want to um, note that we appreciate the participation in the chat and the Q&A. That's exactly what we want. However, I want to direct everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat function. The chat function will just run like a scroll, so it's hard to pair uh, questions and responses. So if you'd just like to say bravo to us, that's great to do in the chat. Uh, but you can put direct questions into the Q&A function, and that will allow us to respond directly to you and to keep track of those. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Dr. Ward, no problem. Um, and so last bullet down here again at 6.15 a.m. in the morning on April 4th, uh, the provider portal will open uh, and folks will be able to get in there um, and, and check the status of everything. They can, and if you miss the, the window to register as a primary account holder, update your information, you can go in there and update that. It's business as usual, right? That's just the start date of normalcy. And so we've been hard charging towards that and we have two more weeks left. Um, on the next slide here, again, I think I've spoke into this a little bit about our single sign-on two-factor authentication, so I won't belabor that point. A key piece on where to get information is this link right here. Again, um, we'll provide this, uh, DMAS will provide this to you. We'll share this presentation out so that you have this. This is a great link, and you can go and check information uh, about your system. That's the provider uh, link there. Um, as far as claims, I'll start at the top right here. I guess I mentioned that earlier, taxonomy is uh, required on all claims. Again, I mentioned that specialty, subspecialty. Another key piece is that we will no longer be printing and mailing remittance advices. So that's a term of art, but you might uh, just see that as an invoice, right? Or a bill of service, like what did you, what, did, what was provided uh, for the folks that you provide care for? So, Previously, we um, originally it was exclusively print, and then, you know, with uh, we've migrated more and more and more to electronic. And now most folks, actually more than 99% of them, uh, just check that information online and go in and check that through MMIS. But there's a small cadre of folks that still uh, wanted that, so um, we will not be doing any more print and mailed RAs. That's a cost to the agency, especially when we provide that duplicately online, um, again, unless there's a specific hardship uh, that's noted. 
Um, and, and we will work with you to do that. Obviously, we're, we want to make sure that the folks get the information that they need. Again, the primary mechanism, though, is checking uh, online the portal there. Um, where do you need to go for answers? This is the place. It's uh, VA Medicaid, DMAS, Virginia, .gov, provider FAQs. The IM team has done an amazing job um, doing, uh, listing all the questions that we've gotten. And a lot of them are informed, as Dr. Ward mentioned, by the Q&As that uh, a lot of the stakeholder groups actually put in there. So we get a lot of good information for folks. Uh, and then we actually, you just toggle on that little uh, plus sign there that you see, and their taxonomy related questions, the payment pause, again, I'll reiterate that, DMS is not making any payments on Friday, April 8th, and we catch up with everybody on Friday, April 15th. If you wanna update your account and your primary account holder, you're seeing Carla Russell provide information in the chat as we go along, uh, in the Q&A, sorry, as we go along, you can get additional information by toggling that plus sign. If you, want, if you, if you have new providers, right, that wanna get involved, we have information right there. And then we have a lot, we, we spent the last few years making videos, um, specific mm -hmm. uh, documents available for folks. So you can actually down like a how-to court manual. Like if you wanna actually download the PDF, we also have uh, videos that we've made, quick look videos, seven minute, you know, some of them are ours, others are, you know, shorter than that. And so it's all how to get information, how to use it, how to navigate, to the provider uh, to, to look at the information to see if there is a Medicaid member, if they are a member, and then also any service loss, et cetera, uh, and how to update your information. This is our current system right now. This is sort of a screenshot of MMIS right now. And the reason why we're showing this is because this is where we post all of our Medicaid bulletins. That's our key mechanism that we use to reach out to the provider community writ large, and we post all of those here. In the future, these will, this, this won't exist anymore. We're gonna port it over to the new uh, MES portal and you'll see all of our provider bulletins there, which is as you would assume, right? Because that's going to be your one-stop shop for all of your information. We're gonna put the bulletins there so they're in one place. The reason why we show this here is because we have issued uh, three provider bulletins. We've posted them. The last one uh, was posted actually this week. And the ones that are specifically related to MES have been ported over to the new uh, MES portal. So you can also get them there. So it's like a two for one. We're trying to make sure we're being um, comprehensive in our canvassing and outreach to folks to make sure that people get the information they need and where to get additional information for questions that we don't ask. This is an example of where that provider bulletin is going to be. Again, this is actually just from Wednesday, we snipped it. Um, and, and there wasn't anything here now, it's fully populated. So that's how fast things are happening as we get ready for go live. So all of those bulletins are posted there. Um, and then with that, that's our last slide. So I will stop sharing and um, open it up if we have an opportunity now to talk about any verbal questions um, that folks have uh, mentioned or Carla or Marianne or Terry, if you have any, if you've been seeing some of the Q and A's, if there are additional questions. So. I'll turn it over to Marianne if you want to um, have any additional comments. Thank you, Chris. I think the questions are mostly related to PAH and credentialing. Um, so I'm going to let Carla go first and answer uh, the provider related questions to access. I think the most important information for uh, providers that need access to the provider portal is, as Chris mentioned, um, the uh, provider portal will begin a soft go live on 321. And any primary account holder that is active or was active in the conduit system was converted by PRSS and they will begin sending the provider portal credentials for MES this weekend. So it starts today, um, it'll go through the weekend. So if your primary account holder does not receive those credentials or you're not sure who your primary account holder is and you need to uh, register for the provider portal, you need to access the um, primary account holder or PAH update or change form, that form is gonna be available 
on our MES uh, public portal on 321. Um, so, and also we're planning a communication for anyone who did not get credentials but needs access to the portal that'll go out uh, next week. Um, and again, on Monday, that is the date that all of the providers can start setting up their delegates. So we have received a number of questions related to whether or not the delegates will be converted. And for the most part, unless you're associated with um, some of the assessment functions, your delegates will not be created. So as Chris mentioned, if you have previous organization administrators or other authorized staff, you need to establish those delegates in the PRSS provider portal and establish any roles for those delegates beginning 321. So unless there are other questions on um, PRSS, I will pass it back to uh, Marianne or others. Um, I think there's a question in uh, the Q&A um, about this training. I don't know if we want to share information on uh, training. Uh, Kimberly Shaw is, is our lead for training. Thank you, Carla. Um, if everyone in, in the chat, Brian actually posted a link for the FAQs on that site as well. There is a training section. Training for our providers began on February 15th and will continue on until a couple of weeks after go live. We have three live training sessions that are available and we also have CBTs, um, user guides and um, other videos that you can access for the provider training. We are working to schedule working sessions the first week of go live for all of the providers. We will be sending communication out. We just ask that you have your checklist available and we'll have, we'll give you, we'll provide the opportunity for the providers to answer any questions as it relates to enrollment. On the training site, I also want to mention we have a lot of downloadable information related to taxonomy. If you would like to look at that information as well. There are no more questions related to training. I'll pass it to Mary Ann. Thank you. Uh, the, the last item that I really wanted to mention is I, I did put it in the Q and a, but, um, I know people get concerned when they see an email message from a do not reply. Um, please note that the message that you will get for your credentials is from do not reply at healthinteractive.net. It is safe to click on it in order to get your credentialing information um, and um, to sign up to access the MMIS. I think other than that, Chris, we, we covered all the topics. There are a couple questions in the Q&A function. I don't know whether the team would like to respond to those verbally at this time or just integrate them into the FAQ. There's a question about remittances. Would you like to answer that now or to hold on it and answer it in the FAQ? Uh, could you read the question? Sure. So the question is from Lauren. It says, remittances have been very difficult to obtain online in the web portal for some time. The Java had to be updated and many security firewalls block the app for money. Will this be different in the new MES system? Yes, it should be easily accessible. They're all in PDF form. So that's why it's important for you to get your credentials and um, to go in online um, to access and download that uh, uh, PDF of your remittance advice. I also wanted to just note that um, there was a house bill that was passed many years ago that um, was required uh, Medicaid to go electronic. So um, we've been moving in that direction and that's another reason why we are moving this to PDF and electronic form. Thanks, Marianne. There's also a question from Kim Ackerman that's a taxonomy question. It says, we provide group home DD waiver congregate residential services. We've been using the taxonomy code of 32090000X. I think I got the right number of zeros for the past two years and verified that this is the taxonomy code registered to our NPI number on the national plan and provider enumeration system website. 
the state is circulating DD waiver taxonomy list stating GH251C0000X. Which taxonomy code do I need to use come 4422? Is the current taxonomy code okay, or do I need to switch to the new one on the state list? Um, I'm going to pass that to Brian. Uh, the only notation that I am going to add prior to passing it is when you um, have access to your system on 4.4 and you're looking at your provider information, you will see the taxonomy code that is assigned to that NPI. And that would be the NPI, I'm sorry, that would be the taxonomy that we would expect on the claims. And also note that um, in cases we might have had to assign a taxonomy if we if there wasn't one there or if we had made some changes to um, some information and um, you have the right to go in there and change that taxonomy to what you think your services represent. And I'll pass that back to Brian. So we have posted some um, materials out there that are references for taxonomy usage with the new system. Um, there are changes on some services and some service areas um, where DMS may have required taxonomies previously. Um, you know, there, there are taxonomy codes out there, but there are some changes on your re on certain reimbursement codes for the new system. Um, I, I, I'm not a taxonomy expert, but I am aware that, you know, for, for the programs, there are some changes now um, for the new system. So, but again, you can get in your new portal and, and assign your taxonomy um, code based on, on what you, you, you aligns with your agency. On the claim side, there, sometimes the taxonomy allowance will be more flexible than what you assign. So it may allow for a few types of uh, or specialties of providers to bill and successfully be paid. Um, again, if you're authorized, if you're eligible for authorization, that should work out. Um, so there are, will be some changes and, and, and we, we can, we can look at those, um, you know, once people are, are able to assess that. I'll also just add, excuse me, Alyssa. Um, I will also just add that, um, today, those of you who submit a taxonomy, um, if you if you don't, you, there is an edit in there that the um, claim will deny because um, it's not the right taxonomy assigned with that claim. Um, however, we are also requiring taxonomy on all claims. But if you if you experience today that you need to have that taxonomy in order for the claim to pay, that will remain. The the other claims that are coming in. It is a required field, so you must submit a taxonomy, but we are not necessarily going to deny on the other claims. So if you experience it today, you'll experience it in the future. Thank you, Brian and Marianne. There's another question from Tony Capers that says, in the new system, when a provider creates multiple users, will the users be able to access the templates created by another user of that same agency? Do we know an answer to that question today? I think this question, Marianne, is about the, the templates for DDE. And I believe that's not changing, correct? That's correct. That That is not changing. And Brian, that was one of the questions that we answered in the Q&A document um, that, that um, it was porting over, your current okay. templates were porting over. Okay. Hey, Dr. Ward, I got two additional questions that were uh, sent to just me. Um, so I'll direct this to the IM, my IM team. First question from Sean McGinnis. Can you confirm that the new MES system will allow Microsoft Edge to open the remittance advices? As previously, it required Internet Explorer, which I hope everyone knows is sunsetting going away in June. That is one of the items that's on our list to uh, validate with conduit and um, we'll put that back in an answer to you uh, later, not today. And Marion, just to add, you know, for the provider portal, um, that is the, the method that uh, providers will access 
the RAs and the provider portal is compatible with both Internet Explorer and Chrome, as well as some other uh, browsers that are documented in um, the provider portal user guide. The last That's question it. that I have in my queue is from um, this. It says um, M E I M E N E I K. Uh, I don't want to. I don't know how to pronounce that. But Chandler is the last name. The question is: Will all old bulletins? So all old bulletins. If you recall, our uh, MMIS system goes back to <clears throat> 95, 1995. Um, so there's a whole archive there. Will all old bulletins also transfer to the new site? We often rely on these during audits. Yes, the answer is yes. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Marianne. I see a clarifying question uh, around the PAH from Emily Beber. She says, how can we identify um, our personal account holder for our organization? So as part of our cleanup effort to prepare for conversion to PRSS, um, providers were given the opportunity to log in and make sure that they had the correct email address and mobile phone number for their primary account holder. If you were unable to do that, you should, and, and you don't receive credentials beginning 318, so by early next week, you didn't your primary account holder didn't receive credentials. You will need to submit the new uh, PAH form. So only active primary account holders can see um, their information in the current portal. So again, if you don't know who that person is or that person doesn't receive credentials, um, please submit a, a new access request form on th starting three twenty one. Thank you, Carla. Sorry, I was uh, dictating. Well, I was taking down your dictation to respond in the chat in writing as well. I also see a clarifying question from Jennifer Fedura that says taxonomy codes are associated with the NPI and not the service. Can someone clarify the association between taxonomy codes? Are they associated with the NPI or the service offered? Brian, can you take that? I mean, it's, you know, I, I can only go so far with that, but it, it's kind of a mix on the claims processing side to allow certain, you know, certain, a range of taxonomy uh, codes, for example, on the DD waiver, personal care services can be provided by lots of types of providers that are on this call. Um, so we would recognize the taxonomy for personal care providers, um, also the DD waiver enrolled providers with the um, 056. Uh, type would, would also be allowed. I mean, so there there would be a range of of um, you know of taxonomies that could be allowed for that payment for the personal care reimbursement code T to nineteen to process. Um, but that the taxonomies associated with your NPI could could range as well, depending on the complexity of your organization. Um, you know, some of these large CSBs have multiple service areas, so they're they would have a a variety of taxonomy codes and our system, you know, has has logic to to sync up with that information and assign the right taxonomy code, you know, through the claim or validate the, the taxonomy code through the claims process. And DMS has published um, some crosswalks from from the procedure codes taxonomies that might be helpful and it's out on um, the web portal. Jennifer Fedora, I hope that that clarified, but we can follow up with you outside this call if necessary. I also see one from Lauren Sherwood. Regarding the training materials, will more training be added regarding the functions after logging in, such as how to check eligibility in the new system? Will it work the same way as the old system? Yes, that functionality has not changed. Right. The only difference is they have to log into the PRSS provider portal.
I am seeing requests to follow up with Jennifer regarding the taxonomy code so we can do that. I see another question from Lauren. We sent in uh, a personal account holder change form, but received no confirmation that it was processed. How can we tell if it was updated? Do we need to call or is there a way to check in the new web portal? So if you um, did not receive your credentials this weekend, unfortunately, we don't have a way um, to check right now. Uh, so again, if you don't get the credentials, please um, reach out to Gainwell beginning 321. Um, we can provide the contact information in chat. And Carla, I believe that contact information is either in the Medicaid memo just got posted or is being posted or the, or the 1 before that. In addition, I will just add anything that was in house at conduit. They did process. Um, and you ought to be able to check that then on 321. Correct Carla. That's correct. I'm just viewing and checking through our chat and our Q&A to assure that I'm reaching everyone. I do have a note from Daniel K who says that as he currently understands it all, all users cannot access templates across an agency. So it sounds like that person's experience is that the current functionality doesn't allow sharing of templates. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I think this is off of the prior question about whether the new MES system different sh shared account holders from a single agency could access templates made by other users at that agency. So I will just say this that um, and Carla might be able to add more information and we can certainly put this in a, a Q and a document um, for later reference. Um, but um, access to anything um, is role based. And I would assume that would have to be assigned by your PAH if you would have access in order to be able to do that. I agree with the with the role based information for the provider portal. However, I do think we should follow up with conduit on this specific question. And Lauren does know that they are able to see DB. If we select MPI level instead of user level, so Daniel, maybe there's a tip for you there. We're having a little trouble with your audio, Alyssa. Sorry, I, uh, I have the DMAS uh, video problem of in order to be close to my mic, I also have to put my face very close to the screen. <laughs> Here I come again. I don't see any other questions popping up currently in the Q&A. So if anyone has any and would like to add them before we end the call, please do take this time to put them in. And I just wanted to point out also the, the make sure you're checking out the new MES website um, with all the training, the FAQ um, information, you know, just going there, there's, there's a lot of material out there. It's um, pretty overwhelming the amount of uh, material that's out there. So learn, learn what you need to focus on. And, and really it's this provider portal is, is the main thing. So you, you're able to manage your whole provider account. And um, there is a question about where they can find the training downloads from Cliff. Cliff, I think you may be just referencing the training, all of the trainings available on the website. Does somebody want to provide a link? Yeah, I can put the link in there. On the training website, to the right-hand side, you will see the taxonomy downloads, but I will put that link again in the chat. Thanks so much, Kimberly.
Well, I want to thank everyone. Um, yeah, this is very helpful for us to have the kind of question and answer, um, you know, and to have that dialogue so we can generate more helpful information for posting um, as resources for you. Um, we, you know, just we we uh, are trying to support you uh, with this big change um, with our systems, but we're we're very excited about the new system and the capacity and some of the you know, the efficiencies it, it will yield for for providers once we're all familiar with the new environment. So. Um, Chris, do you want want to close out or anything? Are there any other parting words? Um, I just want to say thank you. This has been a massive agency wide all hands on deck collaboration, uh, not just an IM lift, uh, but as you can see, Dr. Ward, Brian, all of it. It's been a very programmatic admin finance collaborative effort to bring us to where we are. Um, and again, we, we it's our mission to make sure that we get the right information to you. So that we can have a successful transition. The questions that you asked today are some of them we haven't received before. And so we'll post those on our FAQs and we'll make sure that we continue <clears throat> to provide as much information as we can. DMAS is we we bend over backwards to help folks uh, and to make sure they get the right the right uh, connections that they need to. So please don't hesitate to outreach uh, to any of your, you know, the folks that you normally do, and then they always route the questions to us. You know, you can always ask MES at dmas.virginia.gov. We monitor that. There's over 50 routes of ways people can get information, and, and those are listed actually in some of the provider memos so that we put out the very first one, actually. Um, so we, we are here to serve you and make sure that uh, we have a smooth transition. So, again, don't hesitate to keep asking those questions. Um, we are grateful for them. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Thank you everyone else for attending the call. If we didn't get to any of these questions uh, by mistake, we will be uh, taking all of the questions out of here to assure that they're represented in the FAQ. Again, this was recorded and we will place it on the DMAS website. We hope that everyone has a wonderful weekend and look out for those credentials coming to your email boxes. Thanks, Dr. Ward. Have a good weekend. Thanks everyone, have a great weekend.